Hey there, welcome back to another video. This time around, it is my review of the 2023 drama, The Holdovers. Now, before I get around to sharing more of my thoughts on this film, I would like to give a special shout out to uh, Brock for requesting this review. And if there's another film, TV show, or topic that you would like to see me discuss in the future, feel free to donate to either my PayPal or to my Patreon. The link to both is in the video description down below. And... I will try to get to your request as soon as I possibly can. Now, The Holdovers is a film that last year became a pretty significant critical darling. Uh, it came out, got a lot of good reviews, did decent box office numbers for an indie drama, and it was definitely more of a bounce back and a return to form for the director, Alexander Payne, after... A pretty painful flop in uh, downsizing that he did uh, years prior, which still acts to this day, I believe, as like his biggest uh, critical failure uh, of his career to date. Now, I was I wasn't really that interested in this movie, to be honest, because I'm not super big on these kind of films, so I didn't really seek it out. Uh, last year, but there were a lot of people on uh, YouTube on the platform uh, that I respect their opinions and, and I like what they have to say. And one of them was uh, uh, Brad Jones, a cinema snob, and I, I saw that he really, really liked uh, the holdovers. And there were a few other critics that were really uh, uh, impressed with it. And so it's one that I definitely had on a watch list to maybe check out someday down the road uh, just to see if it was as good as, as other people were making out to making it out to be. Also, I am a fan of Paul Giamatti. I think he's a really great actor. So it's one of those things where I would have eventually saw the film, uh, but it definitely wasn't near the top of my list. And after seeing it, I don't think it's a complete and total masterpiece. There are other coming of age dramas that I've seen that I like more than this, but I did like the film. I I, I thought it was uh, I thought it was pretty good. I I think it could have been great if it was paced better and if it took a little bit of a different route when it comes to the story. But as it is, uh, I I I definitely do feel that it's it's a pretty effective. Uh, drama. It's directed by Alexander Payne, and the direction in this, it's very, um, I wouldn't say restrained, I don't think that's the right word for it, but it definitely is very old-fashioned, and that's by intent. There's really not a lot of wild, crazy, inventive camera work here, because the movie is trying to be an authentic film from the time period of the early 70s and a lot of films from that era the camera was limited in terms of the movement and what it could do and so you don't have a ton of unique pov angles you don't have a lot of crazy pans or zooms or anything like that and since it's a more close intimate drama I don't really feel that was needed anyway. It would have been pretty distracting. So instead, what Alexander Payne does is he focuses on authenticity and uh, really getting up and close uh, and, and personal with, with, uh, with the characters and, and with the cast. And I, I think that really does pay off. And it's not like there aren't any shots in the film that are more than just uh, sequences involving two people talking to one another. Like, there is an attempt to definitely give the uh, school uh, a certain uh, visual uh, personality. There is an attempt to showcase some other settings like Boston and some various uh, unique uh, places in and around Boston. And... It's a film that 
because of that approach, it just makes things so much more immersive. It's really easy to become immersed into this film's story and its characters because of the fact that it's shot in a way that is very naturalistic. It's very natural, it's very uh, even keeled, and there really isn't a lot about it that feels like something out of the realm of fantasy. And I think there's something to be said about directing that's a little more understated like this because I think it's a lot harder to pull off and do it well than than people uh, would initially lead you to believe. Like you would think that, oh, okay, that making a more laid back, kind of laid bare film from a filmmaker's perspective, that's that's that that's a lot easier to do than something that's a lot more ambitious and creative and imaginative in terms of the camera work. But I think finding that consistency and consistently finding that sweet spot, so to speak, cinematically is something that is not necessarily as easy as it might sound. And I think Alexander Payne just finds that sweet so sweet spot so uh, well with his direction in this film. The, the script by David uh, Hemmingson. What I really like about this script is how it subverts your expectations. Initially, it seems like it's just another typical coming of age drama involving some teenage kid who needs to uh, learn a lesson. And he does that by forming an unlikely connection with a teacher of his and also finding a new bond with other students at the school because he's forced to spend um, his uh, winter break at this boarding school because he's not allowed to spend it with his mom. Uh, and... So now he's stuck with this rival of his who he hates his guts and 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 the rival feels the same way about him, is mad at him because of the fact that he pretty much screwed him out of an opportunity to uh, get a retake on his test that he didn't do well on. And there's this football player who's rebelling against his father and... There's these two younger kids who have their own uh, uh, issues and their own things they're trying to work through. Uh, one of them is an Asian kid who feels like an outcast because of his ethnicity and because of other uh, um, other things that he's working through. Another one is a kid who's a Mormon and he's feeling like he's ostracized because of his religion and, and all of this other sort of stuff. And so you're thinking that, okay, this uh, ragtag group of kids of different ages, they're going to uh, learn how to work together, work through their differences, form a bond with this teacher who initially they don't care for. The teacher is also going to learn a lesson in his own life through this whole experience and become better for it. So... You're thinking that that's where this film is going to go, but it doesn't go there. It actually goes into a much more, uh, I wouldn't say necessarily unique direction, but it goes into a different direction. And I really appreciate that about this story because once you think that you know where this is going to go, it just pulls the rug out from underneath you. And then it's like, no, it isn't going this way. Pretty much all of those kids, they're gonna get on uh, the football players, uh, the football player um, son's um, helicopter that his daddy brought uh, down to the school, so he can go skiing on the mountains. And so all the rest of the kids are invited to go, and so they go on this helicopter, and they're gone. They're out of the movie for. Pretty much the last, I would say, probably the last hour or so of the film. And instead, it's 
now a much more intimate story involving Paul Hunnam, the teacher, and this troubled student who's being held over, and, and Angus, and the cafeteria manager, Mary. And so it, it deals with the three of them, and that is a direction that I, I definitely did not expect initially, and that's really what makes this film work, is once it starts moving in that direction. That being said, I feel that even that portion of the film could have been tweaked a little bit. This movie is over two hours, and it really doesn't need to be that long. It's a film that really suffers from some pacing issues that really make it drag, especially in the first half when it just seems like it's just a typical cliched coming-of-age drama with a bunch of kids learning to work together, work past their differences along with this teacher. And there's this subplot involving the cafeteria manager, Mary, and how she's trying to deal with the grief of the loss of her son. And I know a lot of people who have seen this film, they like this character. They think this whole subplot is really integral to the film, or they think it adds a lot to the movie. I felt otherwise. Like It's not like it's a bad performance. It's not a bad character. It's just a, it's just a subplot that I feel isn't as interesting as the stuff involving Angus and Hunnam. Because with Angus and Hunnam, the way that things are written, you don't really know what is holding them back. What is, what is making them unwilling to move forward in their lives? W with Mary, you know immediately what it is. She lost her son in Vietnam. And that's, that's, what, that's what she's trying to move uh, 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 ahead from. That's what she's trying to move past. And to me, th that it isn't. It's just not as interesting as what's going on with uh, Hunnam and, and Angus. Because the script just does just a, a, a wonderful job really uh, continuing to make you intrigued and throwing some breadcrumbs in there or throwing a little bit of uh, hints, but not really giving things away uh, right off the bat. So it becomes a, a, a journey of not only uh, self-discovery for the characters in the film as it goes on, but also for the audience. And so it makes it all the more compelling. But when it comes to what's going on with Mary... It just feels like they're dragging it, it out. And yeah, I'm just it, it just every time that the story moves away from Angus and Hunnam and goes to Mary and what she's dealing with, it's it loses me because of that because it's just if it's just something that's just very obvious in terms of what she needs to do. And I think if they didn't give it away that her son died or her son uh, uh, was lost in Vietnam and they did a similar thing where they make you think that it's one thing, like maybe they make you think that he moved away or he, he, he decided to um, break things off with his mom. They had some kind of fight or something. You, you make it makes it seem like something that turns out to be completely different in the end. Like what's happening with with uh, Hunnam and with Angus. And what do I mean by that? With, with Hunnam, for instance, you find out what happened to him at Harvard. You find out why he's stuck at this boarding school, the same school that he went to when he was a kid. You find out why he's being so much of a pushover. You find out why he's struggling in terms of moving away from this school, why he's spending pretty much almost every waking hour and waking moment in this school living there uh, and unwill unwilling and, uh, and in his mind unable to move on from it. 
you find out why Angus is so troubled. You find out why he is so upset and he's quick to uh, being angry. And you find out why he's so much in turmoil when it comes to his emotions because his father lost his mind. So you, this, this is all stuff that you get to know throughout the course of the film and specifically with Hanum and, and Angus, you learn this through their journey to Boston, this trip to Boston, which I love that part of this script. I thought it was brilliantly written. It was very uh, effectively emotional and it was also witty at times and the film really came alive when it focused on Angus and Hunnam and their trip to Boston and them spending time together and getting to know one another and forming this unlikely bond. And I really feel that that's what the focus of the film should have been. Should have had more scenes with these two getting to know each other more. And they should have started the trip to Boston even earlier. And as much as I do appreciate the whole, oh, you think it's going one way, but it's going a different way thing, you could have just cut that out entirely, to be honest, because all it is is a red herring, and it doesn't add a whole lot to the story because it's not like any of these other kids ever really have any sort of character arc or any sort of real development. So why not just cut them out of the film entirely and just have this whole thing with Angus and he has to stay over and he can't go and be with his mom because his mom wants to go on a honeymoon with her new uh, husband. And you see him just being just frustrated with the whole thing and pissed off and upset. And you see the boredom set in, you see him butting heads with the cafeteria uh, lady and butting heads with the teacher and all this stuff. And then eventually there becomes a moment where he starts to settle down. There's some scenes between him and the cafeteria lady or him and the teacher where he starts to see a different side of them. Then for the holiday uh, break, well, I mean, they're already on the holiday break, but you know, for the, for Christmas decide to take him to Boston because he really wants to go to Boston and then that becomes this whole thing with with the three of them. And you find out all these different things about these different characters throughout this trip. You find out why they are holdovers in their own lives, not just uh, being held over at this school on winter break. And then it culminates the same way with Mary... Uh, getting over uh, the loss of her son, moving past that, so she's no longer holding that, uh, having the bit with her and her sister where she gives her baby clothes uh, that, that her son had to her sister so her sister can use them for her kid. You have this stuff with the teacher and him standing up for Angus in the end against Angus's parents and against the headmaster and then telling the headmaster off and then going to start a new journey in his life, moving past the school, writing the monograph that he wanted to write, going across uh, uh, um, and abroad when it comes to a trip ac uh, uh, around the world to all these different places that he wants to go to. And you have Angus and him fully realizing his potential and seeing that he can make the best of this. He's not a total fuck up. He's not a total uh, 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 mistake. He's not a loser. He's just he's he's a he's a son who's dealing with a, a, a serious trauma in terms of the loss of his father and how his mother is so unwilling to understand his, 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 his point of view and, and just wants to be completely separated from his father because his father is no longer there mentally. 
And so that eats away at him and it leads him to lash out and leads him to doing things um, that hurt him and hurt his future. And because he is having a hard time coming to grips with that. And he finally comes to grip grips with that when he goes and sees his father again and realizes that his father is is truly gone and the best thing for him to do is is to move on from that and and the best way to make his father proud in terms of whatever is left inside his father's uh, uh, mind is to do just that is to succeed in school and and to not be the problem child anymore and yeah i just i i love the way the things wrap up with the, in the film and i like the 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 moments with the characters where they're talking with one another and they're sharing connections with each other and the, like the ch and, and even little scenes like the cherry's jubilee scene i love that sequence so i think with this film, with this script, there's a great second half. There's a middling, just kind of okay first half. And then there's kind of a middle that's kind of sagging a little bit. Because it's tr it's trying to, to balance a lot of this stuff out. And I think it's trying to do a little bit too much. When I, I think being a little bit more simple, a little bit more straightforward with the approach trimming some things out like the whole party s scene like like the whole stuff involving the girl who is a co-worker at the school who sends mixed signals that that Hunnam seems to interpret as her wanting to be with him or finding him attractive and then you find out that she already has a boyfriend and the whole party thing was just her being nice and there's this whole bit with uh, Angus and this other girl who I think is the, the party hostess's niece. And they have a romantic moment in the basement while they're doing finger paints. And it doesn't really lead to anything. So I'm like, you don't really need that whole sequence. It, it, I, I guess it's there to, tr to further establish the fact that it's a holiday film. That's another aspect of the film that wasn't necessarily... Uh, uh, completely needed. It didn't have to be a holiday movie. It didn't have to be a Christmas film. I, it could have taken place at any time of the year. It didn't necessarily have to be a holiday film in any any capacity, if you ask me. It just seems to be there more for aesthetics than anything else. Or to try to, sh try to provide a different kind of Christmas movie, one that has discomfort and joy, which is actually the tagline of the movie. But it's still one of those things where I don't really feel it's completely necessary. But like I said, I, I, I think it's still a good script. It's still a good story for the most part. But I think it it really should have taken a, a different path. It's the path that it did take. It was a bit too meandering at times. Kind of lost me a little bit. And... All of that being said, like it's got some great lines of dialogue. It's got some really good character moments. It's got some great scenes with characters uh, really sharing a lot of intimate details with one another and, and doing so in a way that it felt very real. The, the sequence where Angus goes and sees his father at the hospital... That is the one scene to me that really elevated this film from just kind of there and average to far above that. Because there's not enough films and there's not enough stories in general that show that reality. The reality that there are sons, there are daughters who deal with that trauma, that see their loved ones, that see their father or their mother there in the flesh, but not in their mind. Because they are gone. They're gone mentally. They're no longer there. And that is such a difficult thing to cope with. And, and my heart goes out to every single person who has dealt with that. And I hope that through this film, more people can, can understand 
what that feels like. And it's it's not an alien thing. It's not something that's an outlier or it's not something that's abnormal or it's something that people just don't want to talk about because it's too uncomfortable. I hope it opens up more of a discussion about this because this is definitely something that a lot of people deal with. So I really appreciate that about the film as well as a lot of other things when it comes to the story. Another thing I appreciate about it is the cast. I mean, Paul Giamatti is great. This is, uh, this is definitely one of his best performances. You could even say like it's his best performance of his career to date. I mean, the fact that he acted with a fake eye. Yeah. He had this, uh, uh, um, specially made contact lens that he acted with throughout this film to make it look like he has a lazy eye and it was very effective. It looked real. And because of how effective it was, he, he could barely even see out of one of his eyes. So to deliver such an authentic, such a moving, such an enjoyable performance while only being able to see out of one eye, that's incredible. He deserves all the accolades and then some for that. And I just, I just love the nuances and the different layers that he brought to his, this performance where he wasn't afraid to be kind of a sad sack, kind of a loser at the beginning, a guy who's complacent in his life, who's just, you know, accepting that he's, uh, you know, this cast off and throughout the film, he gains more self-confidence in himself through a, this unlikely bond that he forms with this student of his. And by the end of the movie, he finally has the, the guts and the balls to stand up for himself and for what he believes in and move on from what was comfortable, what was easy, and what was, in, in essence, kind of killing him. And the same thing happens with Dominic Sessa. And this is a tremendous performance for a first time actor. He had only done a lot of drama stuff in terms of uh, theater work before uh, doing this film. He had no other feature film credits. And the, the director, Alexander Payne, and a lot of other people involved with the production, they were a bit leery of him being uh, Angus because of this, but Paul Giamatti, he stood up for him and he was like, no, this kid is great. And I want him in the movie. I want to work alongside him. And the, and, and he was totally dead on right on the money when it comes to Dominic Sessa. Uh, I, I, I was really impressed with this performance because he did a great job making me hate this kid initially. Like, this kid's a little shit. Like, what an asshole. Not likable. Uh, honestly reminded me of Keith Gordon when he was possessed by Christine. Like, when he was fully on uh, possessed by the car and was just acting like a total dick. That's what it reminded me of. And then as the film goes on and you get to know him more and you get to see different sides of him... Uh, you see him in a different light and that's 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 a sign of a, an incredible performance a fantastic performance because how how effectively he was able to convey both sides of this character and the chemistry that he had with Paul Giamatti was was brilliant uh divine joy randolph she was good too uh, as mary uh she definitely provided I would say the most comic relief when it comes to any sort of comedy that was in there with some of her jabs, some of her lines of dialogue. She did a good job effect effectively conveying different emotions as well when it comes to her performance. Like I said, her performance is not the problem when it comes to the subplot involving her character. I just feel the way that that whole subplot was written, it, it just, it just wasn't as strong or as captivating as, as, the other plots involving the other two characters, but it's still a, a really raw and strong and, and, and authentic performance in its own right. 
Kerry Preston's okay too as Crane, uh, Miss Lydia Crane, the assistant to Dr. Woodrup. Um, the, the, the other holdovers like Brady, Brady Hepner is Teddy Kunst. Uh, Ian Dolly is Alex Allerman. Jim Kaplan is E. June Park. Michael Provost is Jason Smith. Oh, uh, they were fine, but like I said, there really wasn't a lot for them to do. They didn't really have any arcs. They didn't really have any real character development. They just existed as red herrings in terms of the plot to make you think, oh, okay, this is what's going to happen. They're going to be uh, a big part of the movie, but then they're not. They get in the helicopter and fly away, and they're gone for most of the movie until they show up like a little bit near the end. Um... And you also have Andrew Garman, who played the headmaster. Um, the guy did a really good job playing, just a total prick. Um, but yeah, good performances by pretty much everybody in the cast. I wouldn't really say there's a single performance in the cast-wise that doesn't work or or is inauthentic. Uh, the cinematography by El uh, Ejol uh, Burled, uh, I want to give a lot of praise for because... This film legitimately looks like a movie that was shot in the 70s. And I know that was the intent of Alexander Payne and some other people involved with the production. Like, they really wanted to make it as authentic as possible, which is why they went with this cinematographer in the first place. And the result is really quite something else. Because from the opening credits, using the old Universal Pictures logo, uh, and then just the way the titles appear, and just the way that everything is kind of set up even hear film crackles and it, it looks like it's shot on film. Like it's actually one of those films that is shot. I believe it might've still been shot digitally, but it's something that was shot with fairly modern techniques, but actually still looks like something from the time. It doesn't look like it's some kind of forced period piece where they're just, throwing a filter on over it. That's not what you get here. And it's very authentic from the hairstyles to the clothing to uh, a lot of other things involving the production and art design as well. And just to add so much more to the overall immersive factor of, of the film. It's got some good editing by Kevin Tent as well. Uh, the music by Mark Orton is kind of there for me. It's not really anything that special, but it works for the film for what they're trying to do. A lot of the music more is a handpicked uh, uh, songs that they use for the film. A lot of old, um, I, I I don't know if I would say classic rock, but you know a lot of old, uh, you know sort of slow. Um, trying to think of the right word for easy listening a lot of easy listening sort of stuff which 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 fits for the film and and of course a lot of christmas uh, uh music tracks and it, for a film that's like 133 minutes it does drag a bit too much i i i will reiterate that i i really do feel this did not need to be over two hours long uh kind of uh just really suffer from that it really suffer from pacing problems where I'm like looking at my watch like numerous times throughout the film where it started off good. Like the first 40 minutes went by really quick. And then after that point, it just started to drag and it, and I just feel that things should have been tightened up a little bit more and they should have changed the approach when it comes to the script and the story. But that's just me personally. All of that being said, I still like the film. I still would recommend it if you want to see it. Uh, a different kind of drama. Uh, you want to see a, a real tour de force performance by Paul Giamatti. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's my thoughts on the holdovers. And as always, thanks for watching and I'll see you later. See ya.